It's election season in New Mexico. Candidates fighting for your vote to represent the land of enchantment, impacting the balance of power in our state and across the country. This will be one of the most competitive races in the nation. We're helping you prepare for election day. We as the voters have the final say in terms of who our elected leaders are going to be. Introducing you to the candidates. No guarantees in politics in New Mexico. And we're hearing from you. We don't want to be last anymore. Housing is a big issue. Our team traveled to all corners of New Mexico, spending time I'm getting to know you and the issues that impact your daily lives. Access to health care and affordability is a big issue. It's our commitment 2024 voice of the voter. Good evening. I'm Doug Fernandez and I'm Sally Rabando. On June 4th, New Mexicans will head to the polls to cast their ballots in the primary. It is a time when political parties nominate candidates who will go on to the general election in November. So many important uh, races on the ballot at the state level, county commission races and county office races. At the top of the ticket, President of the United States. Because our state's primaries aren't until June, the likely nominees have already been decided. President Biden for the Democrats and former President Donald Trump for the Republicans. The most exciting race at all will be old hat by the time we get to it. Come June. Our political experts saying that lack of competition is likely to result in lower voter turnout. In 2020, 42% of registered voters turned out for the primary, compared to 69% in the general election. But the Secretary of State says your participation in the primary is still important. She can help you right now. Voters who vote in the primary are more likely to vote in our general election, where of course we as the voters have the final say in terms of who our elected leaders are going to be for the next foreseeable period of time. The only statewide office on the ballot is one of New Mexico's U.S. Senate seats, incumbent Martin Heinrich running for re-election. He's a two-term senator and is running unopposed in the Democratic primary. It's not unusual for incumbents to be un unopposed in their own primary because they're usually powerful, popular people in their party and, and it's hard to try to take them on in a Democratic primary. And in the Republican primary, Nella Domenici is also running unopposed. She's the daughter of former U.S. Senator Pete Domenici, who served for more than 30 years. She comes on, although unknown in New Mexico, she's got a great family name, a well-known family name, uh, which she can, you know, try to benefit from. Other races on the ballot include New Mexico's three U.S. House seats, each congressional district, unique in its geography, culture, and people. Our team spent time in each district talking to the voters about the issues most important to them. We begin our journey in New Mexico's first congressional district. It's primarily urban and includes the state's largest city, Albuquerque. Home to the International Balloon Fiesta and North America's longest tramway. To its north, Rio Rancho, the city of Vision, one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the state. But just a short drive east on I-40, you'll find a different story. Rural towns in the East Mountains, ranches in Edgewood and Moriarty, and the famous Blue Hole of Santa Rosa. To the south, the village of Fort Sumner, with a population of about a thousand people. It's believed Billy the Kid is buried there. District 1 extends as far south as the mountain village of Ruidoso, attracting tourists from all over. It's a district rich in geography and diversity. I'm proud to be in New Mexico. Right now, Democrat Melanie Stansberry represents District 1. She's been in office since 2021 and is running unopposed in the Democratic primary. This district, come the general election, leans Democratic in a strong way. Melanie Stansberry won the district by a very comfortable margin uh, uh, two years ago. On the Republican side, Steve Jones and Luis Sanchez are facing off for the chance to challenge her in November. It's the only congressional district with a competitive primary race. Faithy Buanu went on a road trip through this district to learn more about the issues people living here want their elected officials to fix. Welcome to Albuquerque, the heart of New Mexico's first congressional district. Intertwined with vibrant traditions and deep cultural roots. We asked what changes people here want to see from their elected leaders. First stop, Frontier. In Albuquerque Staple, just off the of Central near the University of New Mexico. <laughs> After a few laughs over New Mexican dishes, some heartfelt discussions. What do you think it will take to spark change in your community? 
in Albuquerque. Community-based solutions, having everyone join in. I don't really trust the government. Um, in general, the government hasn't shown that they necessarily have my best interest in mind. Instead, they're catering to the vested interest of a select few. What's your dissatisfaction? Seeing all the issues in the city and knowing that there are people in a place of power who can do something about them, but are either choosing the path of ignorance or choosing the path of least resistance by saying that they will do something, but it's all bark and no bite. Many of them voicing frustrations from skyrocketing rent. For me, I think in our district, it's like housing is a big issue because it's so expensive um, and it's not really accessible. Um, and so I don't expect to ever own a home. To what some call over policing. When areas have like a strong police presence, I always assume, I think it's not just me, I think anyone going into that area doesn't feel like they're protected or safe. They feel like there's something wrong in that area, that they're not welcome there or they shouldn't be out. Sarah Milkey is concerned about health care. My oldest sister is born deaf and also suffers from vision impairment. Her insurance status with her working ability and trying to get care, honestly, any kind of understanding from people who have not been in her shoes before. Um, so definitely accessibility across the board and trying to work with people and work with businesses to try and have them understand that these laws need to be in place. Camillo works near the UNM campus sharing the same sentiments as his peers. Homeless people, always an issue. I know they're definitely worse in other areas, but just to see it a little nicer or at least see them taken care of a little more would be nice. Prices around here are crazy. I want to see them hopefully try and limit how many people can buy all these houses, stop huge property moguls making rent crazy and unaffordable for everyone. Sam Grant lives just a few blocks down, telling us otherwise. I think the government is doing some amazing things to help stimulate the economy. What are the issues that are most important to you in your district? I think education is, is a really critical <laughs> issue, but it's really complicated. I think it's something that, it's, it's three legs of a stool. It's the schools, it's the, the kids that are going to school, it's the family, it's everything, and our education system is falling behind. Next stop, Rio Rancho, just a few miles north of the Duke City. We caught up with Jeremy May, who runs Secondhand Sam's Indoor Flea Market. They <laughs> telling us times have changed. I mean, I used to be able to, like, as a kid growing up in Rio Rancho, ride my bike for hours, no cell phone, obviously, and no one would know where I'm at or what I'm into, and I'd be safe. Now I can't trust my daughter doing that. For one, crime, family, community, the whole shebang, really. Nestled in the Sandia Mountains, Cedar Crest, a small mountain community. For here to go. Uh, for here. Where sure. we met Ozzy Aragon. Nice. You want to do red or green chili on top? Green. Green and. He uh, owns this restaurant, El Mariachi. I really want to see a change in like the speeding issue we have on the roads right here. Yeah, there's always accidents going on all the time. Fatal accidents, people are always getting hurt on motorcycles, you know. Or, or you'll see like you see like the uh, the rich people with like their Ferraris and stuff like that. There's no control, just going full speed over here. Shannon Lindor says she loves it here. We're in between two diff very different communities, Edgewood and Sandia Park. She says our leaders should focus on the environment. What I'd like to see is a protection of open spaces, but it's so beautiful here. Just protect the water. Let's not become a suburb of Albuquerque. <laughs> Right? Like an ex-burb. Let's just go ahead and stay a mountain town. Our final stop, the town of Bernalillo, where Tony Montano tells us businesses are in dire need. Help improve Bernalillo, get them to uh, actually help the small businesses interpret something that's going to help better the community instead of being against a lot of things that they like or dislike. All echoing the same sentiments and hopes their voices are heard. And I think if we saw any candidate at any level trying to really meaningfully switch things up, I think that it would get a lot of people for and against, but it would get a lot of people more active in the process when they saw that things actually have the possibility to change. Baby Wanu, KOAT, Action 7 News. Every 10 years, Congress allows states to redraw lines for congressional districts based on population numbers gathered from the census. In New Mexico, the state legislature creates the map and it's approved by the governor. 
In 2021, when a new map was developed, the Democrats had control of the state legislature, and it was signed into law by Democratic Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. State Republicans say Democrats made the change for political reasons, especially in District 2, a seat historically held by Republicans. The state Republican Party made several legal challenges that made it as far as the state Supreme Court, but ultimately their attempts failed. The Supreme Court said that the uh, the plan did dilute Republican votes to some extent, but they said it didn't rise to the level of a constitutional violation. The state Supreme Court said that this plan, which essentially keeps the, the majority uh, Democrats in all three congressional districts, is legal. Here is the old map. You can see significant changes to each district. District 1 picking up Rio Rancho and extending as far south as Ruidoso. District 3 absorbing the eastern side of the state all the way down to Hobbs. And District 2 losing Republican-leaning oil patch counties in southeastern New Mexico. Also picking up the South Valley of Albuquerque, which is a Democratic stronghold. One of the most interesting and visible races in the nation. It sets the stage for a competitive rematch between Democratic incumbent Gabe Vasquez and Republican Yvette Harrell, who represented that district before Vasquez beat her by less than 1% two years ago. They are both running unopposed in their primaries. The outcome of the second congressional district could actually play a role in who controls the United States Congress come next year. I mean, it's hard to overstate the importance of the second congressional district race. Nationally, this is where the parties are looking to try to either keep their majority or uh, take over the majority. The second congressional district primarily encompasses the southern part of the state. From communities along the border like Sunland Park, Deming, and Columbus to the expansive oil fields near Carlsbad and Hobbs. At the foot of the Oregon Mountains, you'll find the state's second largest city, Las Cruces. Just north, Hatch, the chilly capital of the world. The district's vast beauty seen in the Gila National Wilderness near Silver City. To both of New Mexico's national parks, Carlsbad Caverns and White Sands, you'll also find the famous Hot Springs of TRC and Socorro, a city rich in science and technology. At its northernmost point, Albuquerque's South Valley, where Andres Valle began his road trip through the district to understand what's important to voters. Welcome to Albuquerque South Valley, a community proud of their roots, and you hear it from everyone who lives here that we spoke to at Barella's Coffee House. That's awesome. I just love it. It's just, uh, you know, I, I was born and raised here. Uh, uh, down off Aslera. The South Valley is a, it's a, it's a, fun, it's, it's a beautiful place to live. While many of these locals told me how much they love their home, they also feel like they're being overlooked when it comes to infrastructure. I'm telling you, this is what bothers me the most: is our, our streets. Maybe an improvement on the road here, and maybe more sidewalks, maybe and lighting, more lighting down on the sidewalks, so we can have more lighting, so people feel more safe. Rita Maez demanding this from leaders. I want to see it to go back to the needs of the people. Um, what brings us to Albuquerque, what brings us to the South Valley is um, heritage and listening to the people's needs. Um, we have an overburden, as many communities do, but streets, peoples, and the needs. You can walk out the doors and you can see so much sadness. Our tour of District 2 taking us 75 miles south to Socorro, a small town along I-25 known for agriculture. Little old me from the coffee shop. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes our voices aren't really heard. Kathleen Ocampo, a former special education teacher turned small business owner, putting education at the forefront. Our communities have different needs, um, and four day school week works for some people. Some people it doesn't work for, and that's okay. After a cup of tea, we headed further south to the city of the crosses. New Mexico's second largest city, known for their Purple Mountains, and the Aggies. I'm an Aggie sports fan. I'm not going to switch to the Lobos no matter how, how, how different. But I, I feel like for politics, that's a different story. A perspective Ross Bradbird wants elected officials to hear. I, I don't think it, we can work our political system as it's one team against the other. We're supposed to be working for the good of the country, and instead what it feels like happens to me all the time is this you know, bashing of heads, and we can never support anything the Republicans do, or we can never support anything the Democrats can do, and that's not going to change the country at all. Bradbird also feels gun violence has gone worse in Las Cruces, a topic that hits close to home at Red's Barbershop. Last year in October, my nephew Zachariah 
<clears throat> was tragically killed due to due to gun violence and they claimed it was an accident but uh the fact remains still the young kids having access to guns. Bruno Chacon, a father too worried for what the future will hold for his children. The drugs are definitely a problem. The violence is definitely a problem. We haven't seen police officers are being, you know, killed in, in duty and young young kids are, you know, dying. But I guess that's a that's a problem across the board in New Mexico. On the NMSU campus, access to public health a concern. We only have two main hospital systems, so getting in to see providers is a big issue. We do live in a lower income area, so access to healthcare and affordability is a big issue. College student Cameron Wharf with this message. As voters, it's also our job to speak up for the things that we want to be seen changed. And if we're not using our vote and using our voice, then we're not doing our job either. Nestled at the foothills of the Sacramento Mountains, we arrived in downtown Alamogordo, joining Miss Alice and Mary Helen for lunch. We are still a small community. We sort of get forgotten. Our roads are deteriorating yes, like crazy. They are. Yeah. Glad you brought that up. They, yeah. uh, you know, even other people that my kids that come from out of town to visit tell me, Mom, it looks like you live in the country. You've got so many potholes all over. The road trip continues to southeast New Mexico, where in Carlsbad, people like Tina Britton say they also feel forgotten, demanding her congressman visit them. We don't come and ask people, what do you need? What would you like to see? What changes would you like to see? You get involved and your districts and contact people, work with them, and try to make things better for them. I feel like the border needs to be maintained and protected. And The same sentiment echoed by Eleonora Hernandez from Loving. I mean, everything goes up north. We're lacking stuff here. We're lacking, I mean, look at how our roads. The trip concludes in Hobbs, the small community dependent on the oil fields and passionate about what is going on in the capital when it comes to their guns. We all have a right to bear arms. And with this message to the governor. She wants to take, basically take them away from honest people who follow the laws. The criminals don't follow the laws and they get them under the table and they'll get them from anywhere, any, any way they can get them. Andres Valle, KOET, Action 7 News. New Mexico has a closed primary system, meaning independent or unaffiliated voters can't vote in the Democratic or Republican primaries. What we have in New Mexico is also same-day voter registration. So you can actually go on election day to a poll, change party, vote in that primary, and then switch back on another day to being an independent. This year, the Secretary of State's office stepping up outreach efforts. This is the first primary election where every registered voter in the state got a notice in the mail letting them know when and how to cast their ballot. In New Mexico, if you're 17, but you'll be 18 in time for the general election, you can vote in the primary. We caught up with some of those young voters preparing to vote for the first time this year. High school students from across the state filled the roundhouse for the New Mexico Youth and Government Conference. Very excited. I'm counting down the days to vote in the primary. A group of civically engaged students. I'm very excited to have a say in such a big election. Others were a bit more hesitant. Personally with me, I don't really like, like any of the candidates. Uh, a sense of fear and confusion amongst kind of some of my peers, just kind of trying to decide for themselves what the things they are really passionate about and how those are going to influence their voting decisions. The future of our country says they're concerned about the future of our planet. I think climate change is a big one. Environmental issues, without a doubt. Green energy is really important to us. Another common thread, abortion rights, following the overturning of Roe v. Wade two years ago. It's been a lot harder for like other states like Texas, Arizona, and such like that to get reproductive health, and they're coming to New Mexico. This is something that I know will be a big factor especially for young voters. Also expressing concerns about safety and poverty. Currently as a student, I think safety in schools is a big issue for me that I'm concerned about right now. It's just really disheartening to see the level of poverty and homelessness that is surrounding me. Voter turnout is typically lower in this age group compared to others. These young voters say part of the problem is outreach. Since they are older candidates, it's kind of harder to reach like my demographic. I feel like there's definitely more of an emphasis placed on older, more experienced voters. Catering that more towards like social media really helps the youth get involved. The Secretary of State's office also finding ways to better inform these new voters and get them to the polls. We're on pretty much all of the different platforms um, and also taking advantage of opportunities to go into schools and other youth-centered places uh, to make sure that the youth of the state know that they are eligible. It's not just young voter turnout they're working to improve. 
We have historically in New Mexico seen lower voter participation amongst our voters who live particularly in the rural tribal areas of our state. In 2017, the Secretary of State's office created the Native Voting Task Force, aimed at making sure voters in those communities have information about how and where to vote and making it more accessible. The task force is helping advise us how to do a better job and to do it in a, uh, a culturally sensitive and a language appropriate way in these communities. Overall, we saw much higher voter participation in our tribal communities in the last two general elections than we had seen previously. New Mexico's third congressional district has a significant Native American presence encompassing the majority of the state's 19 pueblos as well as the Navajo Nation. Northern New Mexico is a region rich in natural beauty. People hike the state's tallest peak or hit the slopes at the world-renowned Towski Valley. It is full of history. The oldest capital city in the country is here, Santa Fe. District 3 extends over the eastern plains to Portales, home to Eastern New Mexico University, then stretches all the way down to Roswell, home to some great UFO history, also an international museum and research center, to flying saucer-themed restaurants, and further south, the oil fields of Artesia and Hobbs. Right now, the district is represented by Teresa Ledger Fernandez, who is running unopposed in the Democratic primary. She is a two-term congresswoman. The third congressional district is considered by most analysts to be a safe Democratic district. Teresa Ledger Fernandez won it by 16 percentage points. Sharon Klosser-Shillage is running unopposed on the Republican side in their primary. Sharon Klosser-Shillage, the Republican in this district, is a, a Navajo former state representative and is quite well known in the northwestern part of the district. The Republicans are running a strong candidate, and so we'll just have to wait and see. Sasha Leninger traveled to cities within the district, talking to them about the most important issues in their communities. It's a welcoming community with breathtaking mountain views and a historic plaza. It's a reason why so many call it home. And you live here in the Taos area. How long have you lived here? 25 years. Almost three years. As much as they love this place, they see issues in the community. Absolute need for people who live in poverty and uh, even above the poverty level, but are having such a hard time making it with inflation and the cost of living and the cost of food. Yeah, there's just a lot of homeless people and a lot of homeless native people, which like pretty, yeah, upsetting. Lizzie Newtick asking this from our leaders. I know that Taos County is trying to put in a detox center, um, and I know that's been held up for a while because um, of funding reasons, but I think that would definitely be something really, really necessary. Our road trip of District 3 taking us about 270 miles to Gallup, a city known for its local artisans and a vast Native American population. I've, I've had this place, the, the Native Star Studios, and I also have the Gallup Film Festival. Knifewing Segura Studio is located near Historic Route 66, a place where he says he sees crime daily. We've watched the, uh, the vagrants and, uh, you know, things like that grow within the last few years. Jason Valentine has seen his city stay stagnant. He moved to Gallup in 2006. There's been some hope of, of some economic development coming in. I think you have challenges with housing tied into that because obviously you can't bring in economic development unless you have places to put, you know, workers and such like that. After touring historic Route 66, we headed to the capital city of Santa Fe. City. We're the oldest capital city in the United States, and it's a special place. And, you know, just it's taken a turn these last few years. He wants elected officials to hear this. More support for our police officers, which is going to um, in turn um, increase the staff and people that want to take care of our city and protect it. He also feels education should be at the forefront of lawmakers' minds. We don't want to be last anymore in New Mexico or near last in education. Make sure that our teachers are supported as well because we have some awesome teachers here in Santa Fe. We always have. That topic echoed 209 miles away in the northwest corner of our state. More than 46,000 people live in Farmington. I don't know how to do my taxes. What's an APR? What's a mortgage? Anthony Bieber wants the life skills taught in classrooms. But I can tell you the Pythagorean theorem. How many times have I used that in life? They need to put more realistic life things into our schools. Charles Boren agrees. The father of one debating on moving to raise his young son. Poverty is a big situation. Uh, drunks being around here 
they need help. No one's helping them unless you go to jail. He worries his boy may one day get pulled into the drugs he sees impacting the community. Hidden in a valley of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, you'll find Rosiata, just 27 miles north of Las Vegas. Jerry Herrera showing us her ranch. There is a lot of um, resentment, a lot of anger in regards to a lot of promises that were made. Her home impacted by flash flooding because of the Calf Canyon Hermit's Peak burn scar. That wildfire, the largest and most destructive in state history, a disaster she says is having impacts on her husband. This is a gentleman who, who was in Southeast Asia post-Vietnam, and he came home fine from that and is now suffering from, from PTSD. And I see other people in our community that are suffering from anxiety, depression, etc., and it's stress-related from all of this. Her home, filled with black mold, now has to be rebuilt. The ranch, one of hundreds destroyed, and she wants this from lawmakers. We need compensation. We can't move forward without it. I keep hearing the I'm sorry's and we're going to make you whole and you're going to be compensated. We can't move forward without those funds. All of this had to be replaced. So Herrera telling us she spent thousands of her own money, but now stuck until funding comes in. We need some direction so that we can get these claims moving. Moving in the right direction to start rebuilding and finding their new normal post fire. Sasha Leninger, KOAT Action 7 News. We've told you about the federal races you'll see on the ballot. President, U.S. Senate, and the U.S. House. Most are not competitive in the primaries, but there are many contested local races like district judges, district attorneys, and county commissioners. This year, every New Mexican voter will be able to cast a vote for who will represent them at the Roundhouse. The entire state legislature is on the ballot. 42 senators and 70 representatives. For those legislative candidates, they go door to door. They knock on the doors. They go and try to talk the voters into voting for them. And so we have a lot of aggressive get out the vote operations occurring in competitive legislative races occurring throughout the state. It's these elected local officials who have the power to create change in your communities on the issues we heard from voters all over the state, from rising rent in Albuquerque, gun violence in Las Cruces, and poverty in Farmington. Every corner of the state is represented from cities like Rio Rancho and Albuquerque to rural communities like Fort Sumner and Moriarty. Depending on where you live and the dominant party in that area, the primary could be the only chance to have your voice heard. Sometimes we only have uh, folks running either in the Democratic or the Republican primary. So you may miss out on a chance uh, to vote for the candidate of your choice if you don't actually get out and participate in the primary. Early voting is already underway. You can cast your ballot until June 1st. If you're not registered to vote, you can do that in person on the same day at any polling location. If you choose to vote absentee, officials recommend mailing it in at least seven to 10 days before the election. You can also drop it off in person at any polling location on election day, which is June 4th, but you have to do it by 7 p.m. And as long as you're in line by that time, you can vote. At KOAT, we're committed to giving you the information you need to have your voice heard. That's why we developed an online voter guide where you can find a polling place near you, a full list of candidates running in your area, and how to find your sample ballot. Just scan the QR code on your screen or head over to KOAT.com. Thank you for joining us for this Commitment 2024 special. And be sure to stay with KOAT for continuing coverage leading up to the election and on election night.